War Pugs. So, this is part four of Pancreas Network's long-awaited series here, Halo Hammer, okay? And this is about the UNSC in Warhammer 40k. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, there are a lot of things the UNSC does better than the Imperial Guard. And there's a lot of things that are, you know, could be desired from the UNSC to be in Warhammer 40k. But, in my own personal opinion, I don't think the UNSC does that well in 40k. Quite simply put, they don't ha The UNSC would be in a similar position to the Tau, but with less technology, okay? Um, their style of warfare would definitely cause quite a few issues to deal with. It would definitely cause quite a few problems for the Imperium. But, at the end of the day, the UNSC, I seriously don't think has the manpower or the ability to match the Imperium in any state. Much less another, much less another Empire, say, the Tyranids, or the Eldar, for that matter. I think the Eldar would just wipe them out. But that's neither here nor there. We are not here to see my opinion on this. You're here to see his. One of these days, people will care about my opinion like they care about his. <laughs> but they don't. And that makes me sad. Guys, the last 5 Minute Lore video I did had Pancreas No Works in it. And it was actually on the Avatar of Cain. Thank you very much, Pancreas No Works, for being a part of that video. Um... Links to my lore channel are going to be down below, so go check that out. Eventually, I'll be able to get back to working on the PDF video and completing it. Um, my new schedule has taken quite a bit out of me. I didn't think it could take out of me. But we're going to get into this. Halo Hammer Part 4. So, buckle your seatbelts, Warpugs. Let's get into this. Let's find out what Pankers No Works thinks about the last hope of humanity against the grim darkness of 40k. People kept asking for it, and I'm more than happy to keep talking about Halo, so here it is. The UNSC and 40k. I'm sure you're expecting me to do what I did in the last three videos, which is break my wrist fluffing Halo off. And to be sure, <laughs> I'm going to do that as much as I still can. I have my objectively correct bias, after all. Mm. But I had to do some creative thinking for this video, which, to be honest, was pretty fun. I wanted the other ones with the perspective that Halo would stomp, at least for the foreigners in Flood, and figured that the Covenant was roughly equal. I still think that, by the way. The UNSC, though, not a stomp at all, at least not one against 40k. Humanity from Halo was a bit of an issue standing firm against everyone else in this setting, I will mm -hmm. not lie to you. Pretty far behind in tech, very far behind in manpower and industry relative yes. to everyone else. Things don't look great for them. With that being said, it's still an interesting scenario to think about for me. Instead of just going through all the reasons these factions would stomp, I had to think of some ways that the UNSC could possibly fit into 40k as a setting. That works. Done? I think so, yeah. So let's get going already. I'm let's... burning sunshine with this opening paragraph. But... Let's go. But first, a word, if you will. Okay. In this video, I'm once again throwing two universes together and see who comes out on top. One of those universes is a bit more tech-savvy than the other one. They know how all their technology works, what it does, and how to make more of it. True. If I were a betting man, I'd say that this is because they use Brilliant, the sponsor of today's <laughs> video. Brilliant is the absolute best way to learn things like math, data science, and computer science without nice. being bored to absolute tears. You know what I hated as a student? Math class. Mm -hmm. It was boring, and the fact I was forced to do it made it infinitely worse. Thankfully, I choose which brilliant lessons to do when I want, and the lessons are fun and engaging. You feel compelled to do them because they're teaching you skills at the level you're ready for, and the fact each lesson is a minigame in its own right makes it enjoyable to do. And since you can do it whenever you choose, it takes away every single stress there is with learning something new. Okay. Stuck on a topic and not quite feeling confident enough to move on to new lessons? Just redo it whenever you got the time and energy to try it again. No need to worry about Professor Brilliant failing you because you had an urgent doctor appointment, but he's got a strict no absences ever policy because he's the worst. You're the only student in your Brilliant courses, and Brilliant will work with you to make sure you learn everything you're looking to learn. Nice. Lately, I've been checking out the data analytics courses, specifically the beginner course on exploring data visually. It caught my eye when I was looking at my YouTube analytics and thinking to myself, damn, I sure wish I could understand why sometimes number go up and number go down. Well, Brilliant's got the courses I need to help me try and understand that just a bit better, and if you... I might be... I might have some use for this if I ever... No. My sadness at my... There's never enough hours in a day, my guys. 
you've got a job based on data analysis or just trying to understand how trends and patterns work a bit better, it can certainly help you out too. And if you're still not sure, let the money you can save speak for itself. By okay. using my link in the description or going to https colon slash slash brilliant dot org slash pancreas no work slash, you can get the first 30 days of Brilliant for free. Even okay. better, the first 200 of you to do so get 20% off your annual Brilliant subscription. Nice! It's priceless, and Brilliant's giving it away cheaply with a free trial period. So hop on Brilliant today and start learning now. There you go. Right. Now it's time to do some Halo stuff. Let's do it. Let's do some history. By that, of course, I mean Halo lore. Now sit down and pay attention. This is what gets me going right here. Okay. Let's learn it, guys. If you want to skip ahead to the scenarios, make sure to use the video chapters that just go right ahead. Not gonna the do USC it. was formed in 2163 as the military arm of the United Nations in space, as well as that of the United Earth government. Initially, the UEG was just an overseeing body, and then it turned into the planetary government of all of Earth and more. That's what UNSC stands for, if you never looked it up. United Nations Space Command. UNSC also stands for United Nations Security Council, which is a real thing, and at least one news station has used the UNSC logo from Halo during a broadcast. Which is hilarious. It was formed during a time known as the Interplanetary War, when both communism and fascism experienced a bit of a resurgence across the solar system. The UNSC put down these movements, or rebellions, or whatever you want to call them, and the UNSC was here to stay from here on out. Yay! To make things brief, since this isn't strictly speaking a UNSC lore video, it and the many soldiers making it up expanded alongside the rest of humanity for nearly 500 years, until the end of the 25th century, where humanity had colonized roughly 800 worlds. Scientific advancement had been going on quite well, although in a lot of ways it's rather skewed with what did advance and what didn't. Okay. For example, UNSC medical tech is so good that it allows cancer to be cured by the onboard med bay of some random merchant vessel. This happens in one of the books and it's at least somewhat implied that this isn't abnormal by any means. Cloning very nice. is very much possible, although very imperfect, and in fact there's a drug that temporarily brings people up to essentially being mini Spartans. Granted, the drug also starts short-circuiting your internal organs, so probably not the best idea to start overdosing on that one. Yeah. On the other hand of technological advancement, the standard UNSC assault rifle, the uh, assault rifle, uses 7.62 rounds. Thank you to every single one of you who left me a comment correcting me that the UNSC does not use 5.56, they use 7.62. <laughs> It was really informative, especially by the 500th comment telling me the UNSC used 762 <laughs> rounds and not 556. Did you know the UNSC uses 762 and not 556 in their weapon? <laughs> when you fuck up one data point. <sighs> That's always fun. Happens because the UNSC uses 762 rounds and not 556. Mm. Remember, the UNSC uses 762 yeah. and not 556. <laughs> no Has the joke gone on too long that the UNSC uses 762 and not 556? Good. Fuck you. But yeah, <laughs> tech advanced in weird ways. They also have fully sapien artificial intelligences, which you better believe I'll be talking about later. Yes. By the end of the 25th century and the beginning of the 2500s, an independence movement called the Insurrectionists among the outer colonies had been causing more and more trouble for the UNSC. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Spartan twos were initially created to deal with these people. Yeah, the kidnapped children weren't even a desperate last-ditch effort to stop extinction. They were going to throw them at terrorists. I guess that was technically just Oni and not the UNSC at large to be fair, but that's small comfort to everyone involved with the pro And frankly, if you want to know my opinion of Oni, like, take a bag full of dog shit, put it on fire, piss on it, light it again, put it on, piss on it, light it again, piss on it, light it again, and then you got an idea of how I feel about Oni. The list of bad decisions and stupid, like, they are Eldar levels of ridiculous, okay? Project. Only the Eldar sometimes do intelligent things, the o o Oni just doesn't seem to. Thank you for your crimes against humanity, Catherine Halsey. At the very least, we got some cool video games out of it. Of True. course, before they invented the Spartans, they just nuked an entire colony world to bring it to heel, so pick your poison, I guess. Just goes to show the ages old saying is correct. Never ask a man his salary, a woman her age, and the UNSC what happened at Far Isle in 2492. <laughs> Around this time, the Covenant shows up. 
And it did not go well for the UNSC. No. What follows is just under three decades of the UNSC getting its shit pushed in. They won isolated engagements, but rarely, usually on the ground, and always at great cost. Some of the comments on the other Halo videos mentioned how the UNSC was regularly winning ground battles. They Given weren't. that in the Halo games you're playing as either the Master Chief or an RTS, like Halo Wars, where everyone needs to be roughly equal for balance's sake, it's understandable to think that, but unfortunately it's just not true. true. It's more like the UNSC only lost 80% of ground battles compared to 95% of space battles. And those ground battles didn't ultimately mean anything anyways most of the time, because the Covenant would just glass the planet and all the people on it before moving on. So that the, the using a video game to determine how well something would do is kind of wrong. Remember, sp the Space Marine games are wildly... Um, they do not put Space Marines in the proper light. None of the Space Marine games so far have done this. In fact, it's kind of difficult to really... Uh, point to any game that gets Space Marines close to right, or any animation for that matter, because Space Marines in lore are different animals, okay? That's the rough history you need to know. I'm being a bit more brief with their history than the other factions, because I think the Foreigner and Flood needed a bit more explanation to really put focus on how strong they actually are. But the UNSC? Well, Halo isn't exactly a niche franchise. You're probably roughly aware of what the UNSC is and the weapons it has available to it, at least on the ground. I'm going to talk about some of their hardest-hitting stuff just to show that they can kind of stand up in the setting, but not right now. There's some stuff I want to cover first. Let's Anyways, go. Anyways, UNSC and 40K. How's that going to go? Badly. Badly for the UNSC. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that I was thinking of some interesting ways for how the UNSC could fit in. That's because in a pitched battle, the UNSC is getting its shit rocked. To put it simply, I think the Covenant could hold their ground in 40K without either going to town or getting destroyed. The Covenant were destroying the UNSC. By the magic of the transitive property, the 40k factions are going to destroy the UNSC. Yep. I mean, imagine the standard UNSC Marine from Halo 3, or any of the games really. Yeah, it's the army in Reach, but same difference. Mm -hmm. Now take that Marine and put him up against an orc. He's going to get his arms ripped off, and then the orc is going to use them to beat his comrades to death. Tragically for the UNSC, a large majority of what it brings to the table would be inadequate, to say the least. It Think about it like this. If you were, if you were in 40k, the... Um orc is basically like a brute from halo only green and dumb in pitched battles it's gonna go much like it did with a covenant maybe a bit more successfully because enough bullets will eventually take down the moronic space marines charging headfirst into a machine gun nest no. but there's a lot of space marines to shoot at and they're pretty good at eating bullets long enough to kill the guy shooting at them true so if any faction in 40k can be bothered enough they can take care of the unsc pretty quickly I mean, the Eldar would have a field day in all sorts of ways. That's what I, mean, I was saying. Where magic exists, the UNSC doesn't really have any psychers or anything like that, really. So th They would get spanked by the Eldar. It would be pathetic. It would be utterly pathetic. There's your most likely scenario. The UNSC explodes. But that's not terribly fun, so let's make a deal between ourselves. Let's do you it. You can all go forward in this video with the knowledge that I said the UNSC would most likely get mollywhomped in the 40k universe. In exchange, I'm going to spend the rest of the video crafting the few scenarios in which it wouldn't, as well as covering a few of the super weapons it has to at least let them go down swinging. Okay. Sound fair? Fair. It really doesn't matter if it's fair or not. I'm not actually talking to you. This is a recorded video that you could be watching years after it went up. I don't know you, I'm not your friend. As far as things go, I'm not actually speaking to anyone. Just a microphone while I'm looking at a script. The avatar on screen isn't me that you're looking at, it's my Lore Crimes podcast avatar. This conversation functionally doesn't matter because it isn't a conversation and the video will go on anyways. Yes. But I'm going to pretend it's a fair deal because I think it is. Okay. There's my olive branch. Yay. Also, go leave comments on lore crimes telling them to let me do Halo lore. Well, you're wondering <laughs> if what I just said counts as a parasocial relationship or not. Let me talk about the UNSC's fun stuff. Let's get the big one out of the way first. Spartans. Let's talk Spartans. Twos and threes, specifically. Although, yeah, I guess the fours do exist. I'll rip the band-aid off now. I think a Spartan could take a Space Marine in a 1v1. In fact, I think depending on the chapter, I think they can take multiple Space Marines. Okay. That was a versus episode on Lore Crimes, actually, so go check that out when you're done watching the video. Play this and that video side by side, actually. Get the full schizophrenia experience. Much of the reason <laughs> I think this is not because I think the Spartans' augmentations are wholesale better than the Astartes. 
in many ways, I do think they're better because Halo's got a lot more solid feats to go off of, but the Spartans okay. also can't, say, spit acid or eat people's brains to get their memories. The reason I think this is because the average Space Marine is a bit of a meathead when it comes to fighting. They're warriors, not soldiers. They have their own codes of honor and infight, and they're basically medieval monks crossed with a knightly order. Groups of them also fall into pretty predictable niches. Sure, you get the Ultramarines and some of their successors as jacks of all trades, but many are very focused on one style of combat, which True. makes them predictable and exploitable. Blood Angels and Black Templars, for instance, are going to hightail it into melee combat. Imperial Fists are going to sit behind a wall and take pot shots at you until you either die or go away. Spartans, <laughs> meanwhile, of course, have their own specialties. Emil loves his shotguns and knives, Linda is a sniping prodigy, but they're highly proficient in all forms of combat. If you give a flesh terror okay. a sniper, he'd probably try to beat someone to death with it. The white scars can be defeated with a plasma pistol when you overcharge it and hit their bikes so they go careening into the sunset like Team Rocket. When Horus <laughs> used the Raven for a frontal assault during the Horus Heresy, they suffered grievous casualties because they do not do well at those. No, they Meanwhile, don't. throw a Spartan into any kind of engagement and they'll do just fine. Just for some more general Spartan feats, the Master Chief ran at over 60 miles an hour during a training exercise once and slapped a missile out of the air, and he's not even the fastest Spartan. Them flipping warthogs over in game is also canon, because another Spartan used an ATV like a sledgehammer and pasted a grunt with it. Their marksmanship is a See, the grunts get the raw end of the deal at all times, day and night. You can't really... I, I, I actually feel so, somewhat bad for the grunts until they start screaming and running away from me, and then it's like, funny, haha, let me smash this. Parallel, their endurance beyond their armor is such that they can go months on end of non-stop campaigning without needing a break, and the Spartan 3 showed us that even the lesser armor they use is rated for atmospheric re-entry. Yeah, the Spartans don't exactly want to be jumping into the atmosphere, but even Vulcan died when he was crashing down on a Macrog. Noble Six just got up and started killing aliens. And of course, while this is only for him, the Master Chief canonically has plot armor. He yep. is said to be the luckiest Spartan, to the point that it's pretty much manifesting in a universe that doesn't have supernatural stuff in it. Precursor stuff notwithstanding. Ever notice? Typhus Kane would still kill him. How in the Halo games, the Master Chief always just happens to find the perfect weapon for the job, or a med pack right when he's a bit low on health? Obviously, yes, this is because it's a video game, and the original Halo trilogy is built very well, but it's also canon that these things are happening to him. You think Matt Ward gave the Smurfs plot armor? There's yeah. just nothing on the Chiefs. His is just, you know, <laughs> well written. That's not to say the Spartans are going to always flounce the Marines. I know I talked down on them not too long ago, but the Raven Guard especially I can see given the Spartans' problems. Their special ops shtick is something that could easily give the Spartans trouble. I just think the average Space Marine isn't going to fight off a Spartan. I think the Space Marines are roughly equal to them, and the Spartans are a whole lot more practical overall. No weapon or tactic is off the table, because much like the Space Marines, the Spartans are also child soldiers told that the only thing that matters is the mission. Hell, True. many Space Marines are probably closer to good guys than the average Spartan. They had to stop sending a meal after Insurrectionist because what he'd do to them can only be described as war crime horrific. Since that's the thing <laughs> that'll probably generate the most hate, let's move on to things that aren't going to infuriate everyone. All right. Like AI. And more generally, innovation. The UNSC has proven that it is more than capable of reverse engineering superior technology. Well, True. it can take some time, like at how it took over a decade to recreate energy shields from a jackal arm shield, it can also be impressively fast, such as how the Infinity had foreigner tech integrated into it. Well, comparatively, 10 years is, when you're looking at a completely different technological field, 10 years isn't really that long when you're looking at the advance they made with shields. It really isn't that long. Um... It could be argued that we're that we are still it really could be argued that if something crashed on Earth from another species and it took fifty years for us to decode the technology to the point where we could start applying it, that would be impressive. So yeah, I'd say ten years is actually really, really good. Really, really good. So the UNSC, while it'd be hurting bad in the meantime, and it'd likely not get quickly spread throughout its armed forces, <coughs> could reproduce the tech of quite a few of the factions on a reasonable time frame. At least with the Tau and Imperium's tech, I'd see no problem with them reverse engineering it. Yeah. Maybe some of the Necron stuff, but that's a big maybe. maybe. It'd also be a lot harder to even get that stuff, since they need to capture Necron equipment, and the Necrons, as a rule of thumb, don't like it when you do that. No. As for AI, UNSC's smart AI is absolutely brilliant. If there's a technological system,
system, they can learn it at moments and know what to do with it. Now, admittedly, part of this is because Covenant tech is based on foreigner tech, and despite how advanced that is, humanity was chosen by the foreigners to succeed them and get all their stuff. But that being said, let me remind you I like Halo more, so I've decided that the AIs in Halo are just cracked. Complete white, machine spirits beware, because Cortana's gonna kick your digital ass. Alright, fine, I'll cut the exaggeration. Okay. Halo AI certainly isn't perfect. If nothing else, you don't turn them off after seven years and you get Halo 5. Nobody wants that. No. But I do think they'd be a crucial edge, because regardless of whatever you think a machine spirit ultimately is, they're undoubtedly not being used to their full potential, as Halo AI are. They also The problem is they tend to want to wipe humanity out. They come in dumb varieties, so the UNSC has scaling for this rather than it being either just programming or a digital person. Those ones can learn anything in a specific field, but outside of that field, they can't really do much in the way of figuring things out. Next thing the UNSC has in its favor, the Nova Bomb. There's not much to talk about here. It's a really big bomb. It's got something to do with compressing fissile material with more fissile material, taping nukes together, and then compressing that with even more nuclear material. Hooray! Somehow this creates a mini neutron star, which then explodes. Is this even remotely scientifically accurate? No. Probably not. But I'm tangentially talking about Warhammer here, so that's hardly a concern. Po the, what is the war for 500, Alex? Point is, you get a very big boom. One of them was dropped by Grey Team on a colony of elites after the war ended, which of note is not technically a war crime since the war was over. Another was blown up by engineers who fixed the countdown timer, not knowing what the thing really was. One moment, the Covenant fleet in the area numbered 300 ships, quite the total. The next moment, 60% of that fleet was halfway to Andromeda. It also vaporized a quarter of the planet the fleet was stationed over, turned the rest of the planet's surface into a very convincing imitation of hell, and shattered the planet's moon like glass. Yay! Were enough of them to be a game changer? Probably not. But if nothing else, it can force the factions of 40k to learn not to group of their fleets into massive, ungainly battle groups when they're fighting the UNSC. Not now, granted, would they actually do that? Probably not. Unless they want their fleet to suddenly vanish like the world's most explosive magic trick. Hell, just toss it at the phalanx. Goodbye, Imperial Fists. Or better yet, the Eye of Terror. Goodbye, all traitor marines. Please? Second to last big thing I want to talk about, because this whole section is just an excuse for me to talk about cool UNSC stuff. Mac cannons. You know, those things you really don't want to fire off. In atmosphere. It's basically just a coil gun. A really, really big coil gun. Pretty UNSC much. ships are basically built around them, because they usually run a solid two-thirds of the vessel's length minimum. The ship-based ones are formidable, to be sure, but they would usually take multiple shots to destroy a Covenant ship. UNSC cruisers themselves weren't exactly the toughest things around, so getting multiple shots oh. off usually meant having multiple ships in the area. But the orbital Mac cannons, the rounds they fired were roughly 3,000 tons and went at 4% the speed of light. That's 12,000 kilometers a second, or roughly 7,500 miles per second in correct measurement units. When they <laughs> shot this thing, it wouldn't just destroy a Covenant ship, it'd rip right through it. If there was a ship behind the first one, it'd go through that one as well. It was only if it hit a third ship the round would finally stop, also destroying that final one just in case you were curious. Out of everything the UNSC has that you might think I'm crazy for thinking can stand up to the Warhammer stuff, this is probably the one that's the least contentious. Because no, that's not even a contention. This thing would this thing would definitely do some work. The problem is, uh, yeah, yeah, the weaponry on most on most Imperial ships is comparable. Because in function, it's very simple and easy to understand why it's so deadly. It fires a very big rock very fast. You don't want to be in the way. And no. finally, before I start writing glorified fanfic for how the scenario could go, another conversation about slip space. I've made comparisons between slip space and the warp before, and people counter with how warp travel isn't as meme-worthy as some, myself included, I'll admit, like to make it out to be. And people have said before, and it's proven in canon, that most warp travel in the Imperium doesn't result in demons, or true. ending up 3,000 years in the past and or future. True. I admit, this is true. That's how the Imperium is still able to function, more so than all the other things keeping it together. It overall has access to pretty reliable warp travel, even if it's a bit terrifying to transmit between the warp and real space. Yeah. The thing is, it's reliable on a galactic scale. Let's make a scenario. Let's say a merchant vessel is delivering goods from one world to another. The destination is expected to take roughly one month. Mm -hmm. That vessel is probably making it without any issues. The problem is, it isn't making it in one month. It's going to make it there in any amount of time from two weeks to two months, depending on warp currents. On the True. grand scale, warp travel is incredibly reliable, but once you start getting to the level of individual ships your schedule is a suggestion not a statement of fact that's that is completely accurate most people like the one thing that it is comparable to if you want to really 
look at it from this kind of perspective, and I'm, I don't know why my eyes are continuously red in this shot, but still, um, in order to understand the, how travel to the warp goes, you have to understand that it's referred to as the ocean of souls or the sea of souls for a reason. And a lot of the, um, the currents of the warp and things of that nature, the reason that those terms are used is because they're sailing terms, uh, from the age of sail. And to, if you were to average out the length of time it would take you to get from, uh, Portsmouth, England to like Charleston, South Carolina, you would come up with a very rough time frame of when you would expect a ship to arrive. Even today, you could come up with a very, you know, very reliable time scale of when that ship should arrive. But in the age of sail, depending on how the trade winds flowed, and depending on storms, it might take it, oh, you know, a few weeks, a month. It might take it a much, much longer time to get there, depending on how the trade winds were going. So... Yeah, that is the most apt comparison. And then, of course, you could run into a hurricane, and you're gone. That's the true issue with warp travel. Trying to coordinate your invasion fleet on the tactical level can be an absolute nightmare. True. Half your battle group gets to the destination right on time, and the other half trickles in over the course of a couple of weeks. With subspace, if the journey is estimated to take nine days, it's going to take nine days. It's gonna take a month, it'll take a month. You want to see slip space travel is overall slower than warp travel. I'm willing to bet on that. But due to its far more reliable nature, it has its own advantage over warp travel that gives the UNSC a slight edge it didn't have against the Covenant. Now that I'm finally done masturbating over UNSC technology, how about <laughs> I tell you some of the finely crafted narratives I've come up with where the UNSC magically shows up in the 41st millennium. Let's in go! Fact, let's talk about a scenario that I came up first, since it involves a total stomp, and it's also kind of funny to think about. Okay. Scenario 1. The UNSC gets placed exactly where it is and is just superimposed over the current setting. You know how Bye. Terra is just Earth renamed? Well, the UNSC is based around Earth. Just magically replaced Terra with the 20th century Earth from Halo. Big E has vanished from existence, and then the UNSC is dead because the Imperium glasses the entirety of Segmentum's soul. The Imperium <laughs> crumbles, the UNSC is made past tense in a matter of days. Thank you for coming to this highly thought out video. Now, because that's goofy, let's move on to some slightly less goofy scenarios. Okay. Starting with actual scenario one, the UNSC joins up with the Imperium. Now, there's a couple of things in this situation that can cause issues, but if you hear me out, I'll explain why it might just work. Obviously, they're both human factions, which is a big bonus, and both of them don't exactly have the best opinion of aliens, between humanity being nearly wiped out in Halo and the Imperium being the Imperium. Right. Of course, even Oni's strongest racist has nothing on the Imperium, but it's still something to consider, because at the very least, the UNSC isn't going to need much convincing to dislike Tyranids. And the, and the sure fact of the matter is, the Imperium would have a very, very easy time convincing them to basically sign up and, you know, join the cause. The fact that the UNSC is ancient humanity by 40k standards means there's a pretty damn good chance the Imperium might even revere them as the beloved ancients come to the modern day. Maybe. Ancient reliable tech that the UNSC can understand and produce at will? That seems like the thing the Mechanicus would kill for. In return, the Imperium gives the UNSC a great deal of protection from the horrible threats of the galaxy while it catches up in the tech level, and I'm willing to bet that the UNSC can get some good progress on recreating a lot of the Imperium's lost tech. This mm -hmm. is the least interesting option because honestly, it just subsumes the UNSC into the Imperium. I don't think the Imperium is just going to let them be allies. They didn't do that shit in the Great Crusade with other human civilizations, they're probably not going to start now. With the exception of the Mechanicus. Ow. Maybe the UNSC can start some sort of renaissance within the Imperium, but more than likely, they're just going to make the Imperium better at killing things, whether or not it's a deserved killing. It's a reasonably likely scenario, but also far from guaranteed. The UNSC would probably be down for not getting wiped out, but also probably wouldn't be fine with all the requirements and restrictions the Imperium would force on them like Emperor worship. Given that the UNSC doesn't really have any restrictions on innovation, that would also cause some issues. Also, AI. That's a big no-no. That, yeah, that's a big go-no-go. Well, with no -go. that being said, UNSC smart AI might actually be fine with the Imperium and Mechanicus. In Halo, they're created by copying and replicating huh. the neural patterns of a human brain. If the right person says the right things, smart AI might not only be allowed, but glorified as the ultimate way to live on in the Omnicize memory. And it, if, depending on how it's marketed to the Mechanicus, it could be marketed as the personification of the machine spirit. 
and the mechanics might actually be okay with it if it was put across to them correctly. And there may be a small chance that since the UNSC's version of humanity is from the 2500s and not the 40,000s, none of them will show psychic traits. Humanity in 40k, after all, didn't really show that much in the way of large-scale psychic activity prior to the Dark Age of Technology. True. It'll be useful for the Imperium, only because you can look at these guys and assume with reasonable amounts of security that one of these fellas won't explode into a demon. On to the next idea, the UNSC outright goes to war with the Imperium, or at least doesn't join it. This time without me just superimposing them onto their mirror locations in the Imperium. If you're wondering how the specifics of this work, given that once again, they're both humanity in the very far future, the answer is very simple. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about how there's two Earths, two solar systems. Just pretend that both factions view the others as a false copy or some contrived BS. Works. This whole video is contrived. One more contrivance isn't going to make it any worse. I'm going to stop saying any variation on the word contrived now. The word just sounds <laughs> zinchian, doesn't it? And I don't like zinch much because he does magic different to the elves and therefore wrong. The situation is going to feature most of the scenarios I've come up with, since in my mind, joining the Imperium is rather simple in what happens, whereas not joining the Imperium can be any number of possibilities. True. Now, this one is overall bad for the UNSC. They're outnumbered, outgunned, out technologied. It's not looking great. Nope. Humanity had to outnumber Covenant ships three to one to match evenly in an engagement, and that usually resulted in two of those three ships exploding. In the name of consistency, because I said the Covenant is roughly equal at the Imperium, and because I will never stop playing favorites, we'll keep that ratio the same. Except the Imperium has a whole lot more ships available to them than the Covenant did. Yep. A whole galaxy's worth, in fact. And that's yep. not even including everyone else. Now, Scenario 2, Subsection 1, or however you want to think about it. The UNSC finds itself isolated in the galaxy at first, and has to quickly come to terms with the fact that it is in a universe somehow even worse than the one it just magically came from. Welcome to if hell! If they're in isolation, this gives them time to prepare, and more importantly, a limited ability to pick and choose their battles. While outright invading other factions to gain their secrets and tech is almost certainly well beyond them, remember that 40k is a big, big setting. There's plenty of undiscovered planets humanity once colonized, ships that have been lost in the warp, and all sorts of other reasons for some group or other to be completely isolated from the galaxy at large. And Just go to the Halo Stars! That's just with humanity. Some Necron tomb worlds have gone completely dormant, the treasures within just waiting to be found by whatever people can make it past the ruined defenses. Relics of the Elder Empire that are outside the Eye of Terror, even if unusable by a group of humans, can doubtlessly be used as items of trade or bargaining chips with the craft worlders. And of course, they can still interact with the galaxy at large, they just gotta be careful with it. For example, Oni agents can go throughout the galaxy as they wish, and funnily enough, they probably wouldn't have any issues speaking with the average humans they find. True. Low Gothic is just every language ever, with each being called a different dialect, while High Gothic is just butchered Latin. Not exactly hard for Oni translators to figure out. Nope. Oni may be evil, but it generally isn't incompetent. Agents traveling to nearby planets can learn in secret what the Imperium and Galaxy at large are like, and plan accordingly. Strike teams of ODSTs and Spartans can retrieve scraps of technology for the UNSC to recreate with relative secrecy. And that probably wouldn't stand out much. The funny thing about these groups is that the ODSTs would probably be considered to be wearing nothing more than unique flak armor at most. And while Spartans can take on a space marine in my estimation, they certainly don't look like Astartes. They're similar in height, as long as you aren't reading a book by a GW author with a fetish for gigantism, but yep. they're also much thinner with far slimmer armor. And power armor isn't anything new, plenty of unaugmented people wear it in the setting. Very the true. The tech priest of wherever they're at will probably want to get their hands on Mjolnir armor as soon as they can, but at first glance the Spartans might not appear to be anything much more than tall folks in power armor. At least- And see the thing about it is, going into this, the Spartans themselves, they can just be marketed off as really tall humans. I mean, that's it. Th that's all they would have to say until they start swinging. At the very least, you can send Spartans out without people mistaking them for space marines because the Spartan program isn't a giant sausage fest. <laughs> if the planet is isolated enough, the UNSC may even be able to integrate it. Especially in undiscovered space, there's plenty of human colonies that aren't part of the Imperium. Beyond that, there's plenty of planets that are in all but name independent. Tithes and trading vessels may only come by every few centuries, if not longer. More than enough time for the UNSC to, at the very least, build up defenses and learn some tricks to hold back the tide of the galaxy. Yep. Being able to recreate Lasguns alone, one of the few pieces of Imperial tech that isn't a total mystery to him, would vastly increase the UNSC's firepower. Not only that, the the, the sheer cap, just the capturing of a bolt itself. The UNSC could recreate this technology. It would not be that difficult for them. It wouldn't be that hard. It would be the same as if you handed 
somebody who was in a a gunsmith, basically a gunsmith, if you handed him a modern M16 in 1895. As long as they could recreate the parts, they could recreate it. They could recreate the whole thing. Although some things, if you want me to be honest, they'd probably be better sticking with over the Imperial counterpart. I'd take a Scorpion over a Lehman Russ any day of the week. This general idea is probably okay. the best case scenario for the UNSC I could come up with because it gives them several legs up they frankly need to be able to stand up to the setting. Much like Batman, with prep time the UNSC has a chance to stand tall, but without it they've got a pretty quick expiration date. Yep. This lets them not only catch up, but pick and choose their battles, and if they go undetected on a large enough scale for long enough they can have a chance to fortify and make allies as need be. If things go well, by the time the factions of the galaxy at large learn a new empire of humans has suddenly cropped up, key planets in the UNSC could be fortified with enough Mac batteries to drown an entire crusade fleet in. Marines armed with las guns, coupled with ODSTs armed with plasma, and Spartans armed with Necron weapons in larger numbers than ever before can hold the line against the worst the galaxy has to offer. Humanity as a whole would still be under the yoke of the Imperium, but for the first time in 20,000 years the galaxy could see a subset of mankind not burdened by the superstition and paranoia of the Imperium of Man. Mm -hmm. This, in my mind, is easily the best case scenario for the UNSC. Able to fortify and expand its knowledge, it could become a solid faction in its own right. Of course. Now, it would take about, I, I'd say, because, to be perfectly honest with you, the tech of the Imperium is advanced, but it's advanced only in certain ways. If you took the UNSC and dropped them into 40K and gave them... 300 years and gave them examples of the technology they could effectively begin standing on their own of course it's also pretty unlikely allowing the True. UNSC to grow wouldn't be in anyone's best interest and this also assumes no one notices the empire of roughly a thousand planets squatting in the corner for several decades at the absolute minimum Although perhaps even if worse comes to worst, over the course of a war, the UNSC will be able to study the tech of whoever's kicking the shit out of them, so maybe they'll be able to claw their way to being able to stalemate whoever tries to do them in. Mm -hmm. Remember, no one faction can afford to wipe out one of the other factions without all the remaining ones descending on them like a pack of rats, so the UNSC just has to hold on long enough to reach a roughly equal tech level. Far, far easier said than done, but not impossible. So that being said, let's move on to the next idea I came up with. The UNSC makes some friends. This okay. could be a good mix with the other one as well, since making friends can happen at any point. But for the fun of it, let's say they have to make some friends straight away. They've got no time for fair and gotta find allies fast. Who's gonna be their best shot? Well, let's get the obvious ones out of the way first. No Tyranids, Orcs, Chaos, or Dark Eldar. Right. Maybe they'll be like the Tower and try and make a deal out of naivety with the Dark Eldar, and then suddenly all of Mirror Reach is kidnapped and turned into a literal fleshlight. Let's not let's not even go down that road. And I I I don't think that they would be that stupid. I really don't. The Tau are just the Tau, but damn, seriously. Maybe the occasional backroom deal with some more freebooters, but nothing beyond that. Allying with the Imperium, like I said, doesn't strike me as particularly likely, because I imagine I'll either want to annex the UNSC outright or get rid of it. No middle ground. The yep. UNSC has things like democracy and free thinking, and the Imperium doesn't like that, so it's either submit or get shot. But aside from those fellas, the UNSC could make some key allies, depending on the situation. The now, the Imperium does have planets that practice democracy. Don't get it twisted. Just once you get to the planetary level and the interplanetary level, things change drastically. Eldar probably wouldn't be their biggest fans, but they may see them at the very least as a faction worth talking to on occasion. The UNSC would certainly be willing to talk things out with them, and the Eldar could maybe make some deals. You stay away from this maiden world, we'll make sure the currents of the warp disrupt any fleets come to kick your ass. Hmm. That sort of thing. Doubtlessly, nice. the Elder will try and manipulate to them to some extent, so it's probably not going to be a perfect alliance. This is still the Eldar we're talking about, but yep. a sort of uneasy peace could be had. The Necrons would be a bit more extreme. Some dynasties might just not give a shit. Some True. primitive empire popped up out of nowhere next to them. How quaint. Some will probably want to exterminate them, which would be very bad for the UNSC. But some might want some extra vassals, and a free human empire of decent size with new technology would be a great thing to have in your back pocket. The UNSC probably wouldn't be happy with this arrangement, but I'd bet they'd suck it up when the other option is complete extermination via Terminators. What's this, paying your robot over yeah. taxes every now and then compared to that? And this would benefit both factions if they can find a Necron dynasty willing to vassalize them. The UNSC gets some of the best protection you can get, and while the Necrons won't be sharing their technology very much, they'd probably be happy to throw the UNSC military whatever scraps are left after they obliterate some crusade force or tau army or other. 
Meanwhile, the Necrons get things like slip space and armies of meatbags to soak up bullets for them. Everybody wins. If nothing else, Trazen alone would go nuts over them existing, so maybe he could help him out a bit. Him and o That was my general thought about the whole thing. Just call up Trazen. Oni could work out a deal. Oni will kidnap some people for him to put in a museum, and he'll give them some museum pieces in return. It's not like they wouldn't agree to something like that. The leaders right. of Otan might also take interest in the UNSC for a couple of reasons. The most basic, of course, being that the UNSC planets probably have some resources and stuff they want, and general trading and economic reasons means they probably won't come to blows. The Votan could do for the UNSC what they did for the Tau, vastly increasing their tech level in exchange for trading rights. Probably wouldn't be anything like annexation or vassalization going on, and there'd still undoubtedly be some conflict, but a couple of the kin might make alliances with the UNSC if it strikes their fancy. The I can see that. The Tau be the best possible allies for the UNSC. Now I know what you're thinking. The Tau are the 40k version of the Covenant. They'd absolutely hate the Tau. Yeah, that could admittedly be a hurdle, but the thing is the UNSC is in 40k levels of racist. The crew are probably uncomfortably similar to jackals, same with the Vespid and drones, uh -huh. but beyond that, they're not the Covenant. While the average ODST was slinging around words like hinge head with every breath, there's also humans in it that were content to just move on from the Covenant War. Hell, there's an Oni agent in a trilogy of Halo books that's basically an elite <coughs> fanboy. If push came to shove, the UNSC would be willing to ally with the Tau. If mm. nothing else, the Tau themselves look fairly human, if blue and with forehead vaginas. Compare the- Hi, uh... I just don't see that working out. That to things like the Orcs or Tyranids, and yeah, I think I'd be willing to make friends with the Tau if I was in their footsteps. Besides, the UNSC was initially trying to make peace with the Covenant, and the first race they tried this with was the Brutes. That went fucking poorly. If they can look at a Brute and decide that's a being worth opening peace talks with, they'll have no problem parlaying with the Tau. Maybe. And if you were paying attention, you'll notice I said ally with the Tau, and here's why. For all the growing and advancement the Tau have done, they're still a pretty minuscule empire. The numbers I could find range from 100 to 1,000 worlds, and truthfully, I'm of the opinion they're far closer to owning 100 than 1,000. A bit more than that, yeah, but not by much, so the- My estimation for the Tau Empire is somewhere around the neighborhood of 150 worlds. And that's pretty much it. And by worlds, I don't mean, like, fully developed, fully developed worlds. Those are actually the Sept worlds. So, um, Tauun is... Their definite most developed world is their home world, but you have the other set worlds like Viola, uh, a few others. There's only about six of them. The rest of them are going to be more along the lines of um, colonies, outposts, and other developed planets, uh, other developed species home worlds that would be more their style. Um,. But as far as a thousand worlds, not a chance. UNSC is bigger than the Tau Empire by a decent bit. And while the Tau could probably take out the UNSC if it doesn't have a chance to grow, it'll be in the same way the Imperium could take out the Tau. At great cost and effort, and it'd probably just invite the other factions to swoop in while they're preoccupied. Right. The Tau, for the first time in the setting, might be finally forced to approach an outside power as proper equals and as an ally, not either a species to be integrated or an enemy you sometimes fight alongside. Truth be told, I think that would not only be one of the best case scenarios for the UNSC, but it'd be even better for the Tau. Once the Ethereals sue their egos and not being able to just quadruple their empire's size for zero effort, the Tau will have an ally with substantial industrial might. Trading and intelligence True. sharing between the two can get the UNSC up to snuff reasonably quickly, especially since unlike everyone else in the setting, the Tau don't operate on a timescale of millennia for their plans and projects. Imagine how hard it is for the Imperium to take out the Tau now, like I said before. Now imagine if the Tau have allies up to eight times their size who they've gotten up to their tech level reasonably quickly. Expanding outward would still be incredibly difficult, but if the entire UNSC military is given even limited access to Tau tech, they'd turn that region of space into an unbreakable fortress. Imagine the Damocles Crusade, if the Tau had five times the numbers of soldiers and their planets were surrounded by even more advanced Mac platforms. That'd the be Imperium something else. The wouldn't have cut their losses because of the Tyranids in that case, they would have just flat out lost. The Tau would also have the mother of all propaganda victories, and Oni would enjoy it as well. Plenty of Imperial worlds have willingly sided with the Tau, but among other reasons, the fear of getting exterminatus keeps most from outright joining them. Well, would you look at that? Now the Tau have human allies who don't care for all this Emperor nonsense and chose of their own volition to ally with 
the Tau. The Watercast would have a field day with the sort of propaganda they can make from that. You could convince entire worlds to join this alliance because they wouldn't just be joining this weird Xenos race, they'd be joining the UNSC, their human compatriots. Oni, meanwhile, as an organization of humans, could use this to locate Imperial worlds showing signs of unrest and plant the seeds of rebellion. They talk about how great it is to live there, the planet revolts, then the Tau UNSC alliance sweeps in and gains another world. This makes me hate them even more. I'm just saying. This would lead to plenty of conflict with the Imperium, and if they push it too far, they might just cause full-on crusades to be called and ruin a very good thing. But if played right, the Tau and UNSC could expand more than they ever could otherwise. Maybe far enough down the line, they'd merge and form one single civilization, braving the dangers of the galaxy together. But that's awfully noble bright for 40k. Between Oni, the Ethereals and their mind control, as well as the general <laughs> shittiness of the galaxy, them being able to survive together is a miraculous <laughs> enough to think about already. Right. And for the last scenario, the UNSC doesn't try and take territory or resist any invaders. They see the same writing on the wall as they did against the Covenant. They've got no shot against this clusterfuck of a galaxy. Time to pack up and leave. Instead <laughs> of holding the line, they become a faction of nomads cruising the galaxy in massive ships, much like the Eldar. There's actually basis for this in canon. The Infinity is. was supposed to originally be the last refuge of humanity, a ship cruising throughout the stars that the Covenant couldn't reach. Ships like the Spirit of Fire were also colony ships retrofitted for the war effort, so the UN... And there's also examples of this in 40k lore of fleet-bound species. Tennessee has experience with making something designed to ferry civilians into a weapon of war. How likely this scenario is to happen, I don't know. The UNSC built the Infinity as a last resort so humanity itself wouldn't go extinct. If it was the Imperium annexing them by force, for instance, they might just surrender and submit to their rules, so no Infinity-like ship. Right. But if the Imperium has deemed UNSC ideals and ideas too far gone and heretical, or if something like the Tyranids is devouring their planets and it's time to kill <coughs> Dodge, it is possible. In this scenario, the UNSC invests resources into putting as much of its civilization into these massive ships like the Infinity as it possibly can. Existing ships could be retrofitted and new ones designed to support a population in all regards, from oxygen and food production to self-defense. After that, it's a matter of building enough of these to form self-sustaining fleets. The UNSC would hold onto the worlds it has for as long as possible, both for production and as a rallying point, but the nomadic lifestyle would take precedence. In right. this case, then, they just have to jump into slip space at the first sign of a threat they can't handle and be off. Slip space not being warp travel, it'll be a lot harder for the 40k factions to track it. Psychers who could read the future could do it, but there's not exactly a lot of those lying around, so on a day-to-day -day basis, that's not much of a problem. Their technology can be upgraded slowly over time, as the UNSC picks and chooses where to land and where to fight making it not only that you could have like those that can see the future like the eldar are they're only going to step in if they see a problem for the eldar down the line and i think honestly if the unc unsc did this particular did this particular mode of uh attempting to survive they'd be in a similar situation to the craft world eldar and i think they'd be in a good bargaining position a beeline towards a planet like Terra would be a great way to commit mass suicide, True. but some outlying worlds could be traded with without the Imperium at large, knowing the UNSC ever visited for centuries. The UNSC could fall into a very route pattern for the future going forward. They pop by for a quick visit, and at the worst, you threaten them and they go away. If not, they hang around for a bit, trade for some gubbins, and then head off. This could make them a lot of friends that otherwise they wouldn't be able to if they were still a normal faction. Mm -hmm. Space Marines and other forces in the Imperium that otherwise would be forced to fight them might be willing to look the other way when the UNSC comes around. Very true. they're just going to vanish in a few weeks anyways, and beyond all other things, they're both human. Tau worlds under attack by high fleets might find slip space ruptures opening across the sky as Mac rounds and more burn their way through high fleets before the UNSC withdraws and does it all over again. In exchange for support, Supplies and technology, of course. Uh, of isn't course. Let anyone get away without making a donation to the Spartan Pension Fund, after all. <laughs> Naturally, the same thing applies to their enemies, too. Imperial Forge Worlds producing supplies to fight the UNSC come under attack from Spartan teams who steal whatever valuable tech they can find before setting something on fire and leaving. Space stations on important worlds come under heavy assault, and then all the Imperium has to show for it is a fading portal to another dimension the forward onto Dawn slipped into making a getaway. Abaddon hmm. tasks some Chaos Lord to take down a UNSC task force and then they decide they'd be much better off on the other side of the galaxy and just refuse to play ball with Korn's strongest glue eater. This scenario gives them the least staying power, but I think it could let them have the most impact on the galaxy. They could At that point, they're more of a hit-and-run hit kind of faction than the Eldar themselves. Because the Eldar themselves, if you track down their craft world, you track down the Eldar.
could have all the planning of the Eldar without things like the fear of Slanesh to hold them back from particularly risky battles, as well mm -hmm. as the numbers to commit to a protracted campaign. If they're outright at war with the Imperium, entire sectors could revolt, as only propaganda shows that there's a faction of humanity that won't suffer Imperial rule, and neither should they. On the other hand, people like Gilliman might show the UNSC some degree of clemency in this case, and task forces between it and the Imperium instead coordinate to prevent chaos and more from getting any worse. After all, why fight this one group of humans who just want to be left alone when you can arm them and point them at something they too will surely realize is a threat that has to be dealt with? Right. To wrap up, one final thing to consider. Overall, I believe I've shown how I think the UNSC's relations with the galaxy at large would be, but there's one group I haven't mentioned much. Chaos. Because for the first time in this little series of mine, Chaos is an actual genuine threat to the UNSC beyond the obvious problem of evil demons and evil super soldiers with big guns. Right. The UNSC is human, through and through. Chaos loves humanity because of how easy they find it to corrupt, and that's certainly still the case with the UNSC here. Perhaps not quite as easy as it was during the Horus Heresy, since the UNSC doesn't have anything stupid like state-mandated atheism, but humanity in Halo isn't fundamentally different from 40k humanity. Their governments in history certainly are, but if you swapped a person from 40k and put him into Halo, he wouldn't melt from the sheer difference of it all or anything. The True. dude would probably just be happy he gets to eat food that isn't made from corpses. This means that just like in the Imperium, the desperate, decadent, deceiving, and destructive members of the UNSC may well turn to chaos to find a route to greater power. Without making a specific scenario out of it, know that the UNSC always has the potential for something to go wrong, for someone important to fall to chaos or accidentally summon a horde of demons. People just can't stop making deals with the devils of these settings. I know, I right? Overall, the UNSC would handle things better than the Imperium. That doesn't mean that some Oni operative or ODST who's lost his squad won't turn to the ruinous powers for a chance at something beyond mortal means. And who's to say someone like Zinch wouldn't cause the Imperium and UNSC to come to blows for his own unknowable plans? But with that... Th Mainly because he's just being a dick. That would be my thoughts on his unknowable plans, but there you go. The final bit of the Halo Hammer series is done. For real this time, I won't be making any more of these. Okay. The see ended up letting me get creative and put forth what I felt were some cool ideas, whereas the other factions in Halo would either be a repeat or I just can't find myself to care about them. How would the Banished fare? See the Covenant video, just with a bit more room for diplomacy. How would <laughs> the Endless do? I don't care about the Endless. No one cares about the Endless. At least Halo 5 inspired some sort of emotion in people, even if that emotion was rage. This was, at the end of the day, more than anything, just an excuse for me to talk about Halo. Because I'll talk about Halo until the sun stops shining. Future Halo stuff will be just Halo. No more Warhammer crossovers. Okay. Of course, it's easy to say that now, when I still have ideas in my head, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, yeah? Maybe Gilman will take a trip to the 2500s and I'll call it War Halo or something. But for now, thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the slip space to this entire little series I've made, the thing that everything I say and do ultimately rests on. A thank you to Alternate History Hub. People kept commenting that you shouted me out before I could watch the video. Really? And I figured that, hey, maybe he mentioned watching Warhammer lore videos and one of mine popped up on screen for reference. Yeah, this is this did happen. This did happen. Congratulations. And then my little Space Marine goober channel icon jump scared me. If you're watching this, I hope it jump scares you as much as it did me hearing your name pop up. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Alright, now hear, hear me out. Female elites, don't you click away yet. I'm cooking right now. Female elites, <laughs> smash. Oh my god. God, I would smash an elite woman like the Covenant smashed Reach. You don't even know. And before you judge me, go rewatch Halo Legends. That what? is a person, right? Like, that is not a four-jawed mini Godzilla. That is a person with a long neck. And you know what? Even if they weren't and were just male elites with tits, I'd still smash. Sign me up for the great journey. I don't even care. I will make like Futurama and get myself death by reptile snoo snoo. You know, it's things like this where I sit there and wonder. Everyone involved with me in some way. Are they ashamed? Do they regret it? <laughs> then I realize that if they have looked at my stuff and still gone ahead with it, that's on them. After the thousandth time I mentioned something like this or wanted to have sex with Maranthi, you've lost the right to be offended when I keep doing it. This is... This is absolutely true. And this is why I nuke people on first contact when they do this stuff. Oh my god. So... His views and I align on that. The UNSC would, if they came in and just tried to go baller with everybody, they would get thunderclapped. And there would be no, the, it would be a curb stomp to end all curb stomps. Especially 
against the Eldar. The Eldar would stomp the UNSC out like nobody's business. Um, they, it would be so much worse than the Covenant, I'm just saying. The UNSC would, however, if they played their card right, cards right, become a technological power all on their own. Because not only are they able to research this stuff, only a few recovered objects would increase their technological capability by leaps and bounds. I mean, really. And then you'd have a civilization of humans who were using Warhammer 40k tech who also had the ability to research it. And that's what we'd be really going for here. They'd be able to research better tech. And it wouldn't be just stagnating there. Because, to be quite honest with you, if the Imperium could research at this point, oh my god, it would be a whole different beast. So the UNSC, if it could stay quiet enough for, I'd say, probably about a hundred years, it could emerge onto the galactic scale as not a not just a threat, but a power. Far beyond what the Tau are. In any case, once again, once again, I firmly agree with him on this. Now, I didn't agree with him on the Covenant video, but he kind of talked me into it. Kind of talked me into it. I still don't think the Covenant be quite as strong as he believes it to be, but I do think they would do okay-ish. They wouldn't just show up and get clapped. Let's just put it like that. <sighs> Guys, Pankers No Works links are going to be in the description down below. Check him out. Check out my lore channel. Check out my merch. Check out all the other kind of stuff in the description down below. I will catch you guys next time. Hit subscribe. I know you guys know where that button is. And I also know how many of you haven't hit it yet. Hit subscribe. Until then, until next time, War Pugs, I'm out. I'm gone. And I'm going to ignore the fact that he said he'd nail a female elite.